Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and in this video I want to talk about infrasonic bass. It's a hot topic right now, and I think it's worth getting into a bit about my take, at least, on infrasonic bass. So I think the first thing I want to point out, and I think people understand this, is that for the most part, infrasonic bass is not audible. The human hearing range is generally uh, specced, we'll say, at between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Now some people will say, oh well, you know, I think I can hear lower than that. I've heard it before. Well, the, one of the problems with being able to hear below 20 hertz is that you'd, to be able to know that for certain, you'd have to know that the subwoofer isn't producing harmonics of the tones it's producing below 20 hertz. Because those harmonics, for instance, at 10 hertz will be at 20 hertz. At 15 hertz, they're going to be at 30 hertz. And that's just for the second harmonic. There's also going to be the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic, and those are going to be higher and higher in frequency. And the farther they are away from the fundamental, actually the more audible they're going to be. So it is very likely that some of the really low stuff that we think we hear is actually noise and distortion coming from the subwoofers. There aren't really a lot of subwoofers that produce very, very low bass uh, below 20 hertz with very low distortion. The other thing is that we know from things like the equal loudness curves that if we extrapolate out below 20 hertz, we probably would need to be producing this stuff at in, well in excess of 120 decibels to even approach being audible. So the minimum threshold is probably pretty high for that stuff. Again, not really a lot of subwoofers on the market that can do that, even the, the, the really hot infrasonic subs. But that doesn't mean there aren't any, and that doesn't mean there isn't value in reproducing infrasonics. So uh, like V8 engines um, or V12 engines for that matter, like, uh, I don't know, caviar, like anything that's excess and maybe not necessary, but it's fun to have anyway. I like infrasonic subwoofers and I have a real issue with them. It's not something that I would prioritize in my budget for a home theater system over things like better quality speakers or a better projector, but it's something that I would spec in otherwise. So in other words, as long as it's not affecting the budget in some way and it's not causing me to have to reduce the quality to such a level that it's a problem, I actually like the infrasonic concept. And part of it is because certainly like big explosions or other things that produce a lot of earthquakes, um, mechanics, machinery, gunfire, rockets, you name it, all produce a lot of infrasonic stuff. And being able to accurately reproduce that I think is, is of some value. A lot of recordings don't actually have a lot of infrasonics in it in the movies. Um, one of the things that many of you know about is that there seems to be some high pass filtering that's going on in a lot of movie production. And so that, that does limit the merits for this somewhat, but you can always potentially use a band-aid approach that EQs back some of the infrasonics or a shell filter, for instance, that boosts them up to get them back and then reproduce them. Of course, you can just turn the sub up. That does the same thing. Um, so, I mean, all of that's good. So let's talk a little bit though about like what makes for a good infrasonic subwoofer. So, a lot of people like ported subs, but one of the big problems with ported subwoofers is that the port tuning defines the lower limit of the subwoofer. They don't produce much of any sound below that because it's falling off at, at uh, a fourth order rate, so 24 dBs per octave. And so what that means is that you're so far down in level once you're getting much below that. So for instance, if you tune it at 20 hertz, you're going to be at least 24 dB down by 10 hertz. You're just not producing any meaningful infrasonics anymore. The cone also loses control. So the excursion now, you're exceeding the max excursion of the driver in all likelihood at any reasonable level. So ported subs would have to be tuned very low to work well as an infrasonic generator, like probably 5 hertz or maybe even below, which basically means a really, really, really large port that's really, really long, and where you're gonna have a lot of pipe resonances. And so ported generally isn't great. And you'll notice most, if not every commercial infrasonic subwoofer on the market is not ported. The reason is you're just better off having a lot of displacement in a sealed enclosure. It rolls off at a shallower rate. One of the things I've noticed, so I you know, talk about Perlison a lot, Perlison subwoofers are sealed their subwoofers produce bass down well into the single digits in most rooms. I actually experienced that with most good sealed subs. So as long as the sealed subwoofer is a good competent sub, it does not have any kind of high pass filtering on it, you will find most sealed subs can produce sound down into the single digits. What can be an issue is some of the lesser ones don't have the excursion and the amplifier power to really 
get you to the output levels you need, which is why you need bigger drivers. And companies like Ascendo have gotten very, very popular because they are producing these ridiculous, over-the-top infrasonic subwoofers that are 24 inches, 32 inches, 50 inches, and now 80 inches. They're massive. Why? Because you need the displacement to produce high levels of output at low distortion below 20 hertz. They're actually not crazy designs. They're a good idea. Now, th something to keep in mind is you don't have to do it that way. Y you can use a lot of subwoofers to do that in other ways. But my experience has been that there's something to be said for the larger driver approach. I'm not saying that a whole lot of 18-inch subs, for instance, in sealed enclosures can't produce just as much infrasonic bass as, for instance, that 80-inch sub, you know, as long as you have enough of those 18s to equal it. What I'm saying is I have had bad luck trying to get a whole lot of 12s, for instance, to do what a couple of 18s can do, or to get a couple of 18s even to do what a couple of 21s can do. And so there seems to be something said for going bigger. At a certain point, you can run into potential issues, which is where having really good data on the driver's performance can be really helpful. And that is, as the cone gets bigger, then you run into bigger problems. The driver is not as linear throughout its excursion range, and distortion can be higher towards the extremes of that. There are some pretty good drivers out there that have pretty good performance at the extremes. The uh, Stereo Integrity 24-inch driver appears to be a pretty darn good driver. Now, what I've never seen, and I don't really know if this would be the case, would be, would you ultimately get better performance if you were to use something like a 21-inch Pro Audio driver, which doesn't have the displacement, but does have a little bit more linear motor, and just use a whole bunch of them? So like, you know, what if you used four of those, for instance? Four of those may equal the displacement then, or exceed it, of that one 24, probably two 21s would actually equal the displacement of the 24. Um, but let's say you went with four. That means those drivers don't have to move as much to produce those infrasonic base levels reasonably. And then maybe that would be better, maybe. The problem you tend to run into is if you don't have the excursion and the driver starts to get pushed past its limit, then you start to get a lot of ugly noises. So people have seen videos, I think, um, Power Sound Audio actually has some pro audio based subs. They look pretty good, but I've uh, now seen a couple of reviews and. Uh, Shane Lee, um, Shane Bolin, who's a friend of mine, he he wasn't a huge fan of his 24-inch uh, sealed subwoofer. And it seems to be that the main issue is not that the sub itself is bad. It seems like it's a pretty good sub. It's that it can't produce infrasonics that well because it just doesn't have the excursion that it needs, the displacement it needs to be able to do that. It may or may not have enough amplifier power. It's hard to tell, but Adding on to that, it looks like the limiter is maybe not offering enough protection down that low. And so when you feed it these movies scenes that just have ridiculous amounts of really, really low bass, it just struggles. And, and I don't think that that's a huge indictment of the sub. A lot will. I think that they could have done a different approach to the limiters, which may have done a better job pre preventing that from happening. Now, that may have caused other problems. And so the designer may argue he had a reason for doing it the way he did. But that is, I think, then the argument for either having to do a ton of subwoofers or just making sure that there's enough subwoofers that have very high displacement um, to, to get the job done. So I'm, I'm actually a fan for multiple reasons. One is who, who doesn't like excess, and then the other being um, I just have had better luck with very high excursion drivers. In my own theater, I don't have anything like that right now, but I have been specking in for myself, some stuff like that. And I'm just, it's just a matter of figuring out which direction I wanna go. Do I wanna kind of DIY it? Do I wanna go with something new to the market that isn't really out yet? Or do I wanna go with something that I could sell and is pretty good? As I said, the Prolison D215S actually has very good infrasonic performance. It's not gonna equal the performance of like a, an Ascendo 24 inch, but I wouldn't be shocked if a pair of them um, or three of them, maybe. I, I mean, that 24 is probably pretty capable, but somewhere between two and three of the uh, dual 15 subs. I actually think two, there's no way three. So two of those D215Ss should actually equal the performance of a single 24 inch Ascendo in infrasonic performance and would have other value. So there's something to be said for something like that. It's just, you don't get to say I have a 24 inch sub or a 32 inch sub or a 50 inch sub or an 80 inch sub. I mean, there's just something cool to be able to say you have those things. So I get it. I totally get why you'd want to do that. There's also room issues. Some people would say, I can't fit 
two of those giant subwoofers. So one that does the job of two is what I need. It's why those bigger driver subs can actually be pretty nice. Something you should keep in mind before you go out and buy one of those though, is that they also need a lot of power. Three to 6,000 watts RMS is not an unreasonable power number that's needed. Uh, we have used subwoofers of that power level before in our room. So when I say we, uh, Gene De La Sala, myself, and some of the other people I work with, and we've had a common problem, which is that even on a 20 amp circuit, when you really push them, you pop the breaker. And so you need to make sure that they're on their own dedicated 20 amp circuit, or ideally when I can, when I spec in high-end home theaters, I actually spec in a couple of 240 lines. Um, and the reason why I spec in the 240 lines is that uh, it gives me a lot of headroom then. A lot of amplifiers that are sold here that, are, that we would use to power these would actually have universal power supplies. And so they're able to work on a 120 or a 240. You know, most of you watching this now understand Ohm's law. If we double the voltage, we need half as much current for the same power, um, or we, for the same current, double the wattage that we get out of it. So a 240 line gives us a, a heck of a lot of headroom. So um, if you do want to go that route, you know, one thing to keep in mind is you really, if, you, if you're like throwing this into an existing living room with a single 20 amp line that powers everything, it's not going to happen. It's just, you're going to end up popping breakers before you really get the limits of that subwoofer. Uh, it's just, I don't recommend doing that. Um, so dedicated lines are probably a good idea, at least a 120, 20 amp. But you, you know, if you're really, really like, if you're looking at like that 50 inch or that 80 inch sub, or you're looking at putting in like six plus 18s or something like that, and you're looking at well in, in excess of 3000 watts of power for it, and you and you know you're the kind of person who likes to turn it up, I think you need to be thinking about specking in a 240 line as well. Uh, it's ultimately gonna be necessary to prevent you from popping breakers. So that's my take on infrasonics. Um, like I said, I like them. I think they're cool. Uh, there are some issues. Um, I do think that having specialized subwoofers, preferably sealed, I really think they have to be sealed, um, is the way to go. I like big drivers just because it's fun to have a big driver, but it, you know, you can absolutely achieve the same results with less. It's really more about displacement than it is just about driver diameter. Just bigger driver displaces more air. And so, you know, uh, I think that's a good way to, to think about things. I'll also say probably you can do a really decent infrasonic subwoofer DIYing for a lot less money. And so if you are somewhat handy and you don't mind either not having a painted enclosure or painting it yourself and doing a little bit of work on your own, I think you'll ultimately find that a uh, 21 inch or a 24 inch sealed subwoofer that you build yourself um, with a really pretty decent 3000 watt or so DSP amplifier is a, a better route uh, for the money. I mean, you could probably do that for three, four thousand dollars, um, you know, which is a lot cheaper than it would be to buy something of equivalent output. So a good idea. The big thing you're gonna have to figure out on your own, which you may not know how to do is limiters. So most pro audio DSPMs have limiters built in and you can set them, but you may not know how to do that. So that's something to, to think about and maybe we can cover that in a future video. So that's Infrasonics, and, and uh, like I said, please subscribe to my channel. I've said that in all the other videos because it's a good way to stay on top of all the videos I'm gonna be putting out there with information that you hopefully find useful. So thanks again.